it's uh, very nice. Well, everyone already said that it's very nice uh, to have a non-Zoom conference again. But apparently, the only way I can project my slides are, is via Zoom. So uh, Zoom is staying for, with us. Uh, and it's very nice to be at this conference. Everyone already cracked a joke about 102 factorial. But I just realized that uh, if we have a uh, 100 second anniversary, it's 100 second anniversary of Lenz model, because there was no easing back then. And his thesis is 90 year, eight years ago, and he started his PG 100 years ago. So easing model might be exactly 100 years old. And actually, Lenz in his paper didn't formulate easing model. He just said that the uh, spins are more likely to be aligned than desaligned, but he didn't write any Hamiltonian. So in a sense. But he did, he did specify the end difference. Uh, Yes, but in words, so without a formula. Okay, he didn't write any formula. <laughs> so I decided that it being late in the day and we, we still have a round table, I should, I should uh, so I first thought giving some expository talk, but then I decided that I should do uh, something uh, more entertaining. And then I had a sort of uh, confusion which of the two I should do, so I would do both. So I decided that if I have two slides for two 45 minutes talks, it's exactly 60 minutes. <laughs> Uh, so I, I will start with a talk about lizards, which is more entertaining. And uh, well, that's the hero of our talk there. Uh, not to size, it's a bit small like that, well, like that with a tail. Uh, so uh, it's a, uh, some ongoing project. There were two, one just, uh, there was just paper in PRL and before in Nature. And um, with my friend Michelle Melenkovich, who is a biologist in Geneva, uh, and he uh, once, uh, after my talk where I spoke about percolation, approached me with a picture on the left here, and uh, well, there was still this picture on the screen, albeit with different colors, and said uh, whether, whether the pictures look the same. And of course, uh, well, you could just social engineer that they don't look the same, because otherwise he wouldn't have asked this question. But also I have looked at too much of these pictures that it's sort of immediately clear that uh, the left ones, if you see percolation, actually it's, it's very interesting. if people try to draw a percolation picture by hand randomly, they never succeed. I remember when Chuck Newman was giving Laudasho for Wendell and Werner, I was sitting next maybe to Michael or, or someone else. I, say, I said, look, his picture is computerly drawn, but it's not random. And the guy said, yes, I also know that because there are never six hexagons in a row of the same cover and there should be. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's very hard to draw by hand a random picture, but this is indeed a random picture with random number generators. And this is certainly different, but then you already see on the right picture that there are more brown hexagons than, uh, than green ones. So we can adjust the left picture for that, but still, uh, apparently they will be different. And you can see it with an eye if you looked at a lot of easing model. Now I asked what is the other picture, and he said, well, it's a skin of an actual lizard, which has this funny pattern, and uh, mm, he is trying to understand what's the mechanism behind that. Now, uh, what Michel does for a living, I'll show a few pictures. This is, I don't know, he usually looks much more smiley than that. Uh, and uh, uh, so he studies these guys and just an example of a couple of his, uh, well, theorems, let's say. Uh, so for example, with these three guys, he proved that our hair has the same uh, 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 <coughs> origins as the scales of a lizard. So he accidentally found on eBay a lizard who was, uh, it's a, an Australian dust dragon who was uh, a bit mutated and uh, almost bald, uh, had no spikes. And then they kind of genetically, well, uh, with some selection, they got one which is on top, which is, has no spikes at all. And then they sequence the difference and apparently there's the same gene which causes boldness in us. So it's, uh, well, it's kind of interesting. Or he proved he has a chameleon on his show. The chameleon is actually very difficult to experiment with because they are very cute. So it's very difficult to get a permission to experiment of them. <laughs> there is this psychological connection. So he proved that they, they change colors not only because of pigments, but also because, well, he hoped that for a while that those were liquid crystals, but they are not quite liquid. So there are some iridophoric crystals which they don't change uh, the direction, but they change the sparsity between them, and it changes the, the <coughs> thing. And uh, so, it's, uh, so he knows quite a lot of uh, chemistry and uh, physics, and uh, well, there is also there are crocodiles in his lab, but those I'm afraid of because they now by now that well they can bite off your hand. Uh, but uh, mostly here, uh, so this was a part of a project he studied. Uh, 
covers in squamates and lizards and snakes. And really, there is a whole abundance of covers if you go to tropics. And there is a bunch of ways how you can get these covers. There can be some pigments. There can be structure of the underlying cells. As I said, well, there are these physical reasons. They are re really like amazing animals. But uh, the other thing you can study is the cover patterns, how they do arise. <laughs> And uh, basically, we all have seen uh, well snakes or lizards who have cow patterns. There are two types. The ones which are independent uh, of the scales, they go just across. Like you see here that there is a scale which is half yellow, half, half black. And there are ones uh, where uh, the, oops, each, each scale is of different color. So the scales, they are morphologically exactly the same and uh, physically, but they have different colors. And this was an example, uh, well, uh, well, this particular lizard, which, which uh, was very interesting for him. Of course, one can ask here a question, does it make sense? Well, mo most of these things, sometimes they, for sort of sexual interplay, but usually they are for camouflage, does it make sense to have these discrete things? And the answer is, of course, yes, of course. So this is an, a, an example of a painting by Serra. So it's painted uh, with this pontalism style, or, uh, which you can see a lot of in Musée d'Arcet. Uh, if you walk far enough, you just see a continuous picture because our eye processes it in such a way through Fourier transform that we automatically make it continuous. And sometimes it's even more continuous than the real continuous things. Or, well, Van Gogh. Or, for example, uh, nowadays, uh, like Chinese army on only uses uh, digital camouflage, which is made of squares. And apparently, in some ways, it's much more efficient than the usual one where you have some ovals. So there is, there is a reason behind that. So it's not that lizards are stupid. Uh, well, OK, it's not that evolution is stupid <laughs> that uh, it developed this. Now, so this is back to this question. So these are pictures are different. <coughs> and here on the left, I put a picture of the easing model uh, in antiferromagnetic. And these are quite uh, the same. Actually, they, I would say that they are the same up to like 3% error. And the story of the first talk is why are they the same and how, how we're able to establish that. So this is this lizard, which is quite common uh, in Mediterranean region, south of France or in Italy. But also there are similar ones. I have later a picture, one I, I just accidentally once saw hiking in Georgia, its cousin, which had also a very beautiful similar pattern. Uh, and uh, when I joined this uh, project, what they did by, by that time, they analyzed the uh, uh, skin of this lizard, and I s they saw that it's not random. It's not like that there's random, random covering of the hexagons, that certainly there is a correlation between them. And the suggestion was to follow the evolution of these covers. Of course, it takes time. So there were four years of observation of observing lizards in a lab. And uh, also, there is a probabilistic problem because you observe <laughs> only five of them. And uh, it's like you want to say something about Markov chain when you only have five realizations of this Markov chain. But of course, statisticians wrote, wrote lots of papers about it. So this is uh, uh, pictures of one lizard over uh, three, three years. Uh, now, when it is juvenile, it's not true. It has actually more colors uh, than two, and they go across the scales. But maybe this is a bad picture because they are not drawn to scale. There is this sort of distance bar, but let me rescale it. So this is how, how they sort of, well, not they, he looks uh, up to scale. And here you also see uh, why for camouflage it would make sense to change the pattern because if he lives in the same environment, you want to have a sort of characteristic length comparable to the length of foliage in that environment. And he has grown. If you just hematetically grow it, it won't fit into these leaves. So you have to change the, the procedure. And you see here that indeed, so for example, in this particular picture, there are actually a few flips. There is actually in this region, there were even double flips. But for example, here you can see a hexagon which gets flipped. Uh, now, uh, what uh, we did, so this is, I won't bore you in numeric, uh, uh, numerics, but uh, what was sort of established uh, before I joined that uh, it's sort of quite clear that these uh, hexagons, they flip. Uh, so it got, gets to be all brown and yeah. green within three months. And then they flip once in a while, all of them. And the probability of flipping only depends on the neighbors you have. So it's a nearest neighbor cellular automaton, let's say, stochastic cellular automaton. And then, uh, well, then uh, the conjecture was that it's antiferromagnetic easing. And the best fit to what we have is uh, with these parameters. So uh, the second one, it means that it's in magnetic field, so it's tilted towards brown scale. So it's it, that you can easily see in the picture. And the first one means that there is a, a negative temperature. Uh, so uh, so uh, nearby hexagons try to be of opposite color. Uh, and uh, 
This model is frustrated on hexagonal lattice, so you can easily cover uh, square lattice in chess chessboard pattern, but you cannot hexagonal lattice because when you go around, there are three of them, you can cover them black, white, black, white, black, white, uh, or you will continue covering forever. Uh, and uh, so there are like uh, infinitely many patterns which, uh, which minimize the energy, and they all have these labyrinthine <laughs> structures, which are good for camouflage. And not only we established this, but because by that time we already had like four years of observation, we established that actually it looks very much like Glauber dynamics. So the probabilities are a little bit off, uh, but uh, well enough that uh, you, you have this, the, sa the same sort of measure. So this is uh, on the top, it's a movie of actual lizard every two weeks, and on the bottom is uh, Glauber simulation. So that's, uh, uh, well, sort of statistically gives all, all, all the same pattern. So we took, took this, this lizard and, and ran it with this boundary, with, the, with, the, with this initial data. Now, how does a lizard know about Glauber? Sorry? How does a lizard know about Glauber? I, 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 well, they, I, I said they're not stupid. They're not stupid. They're not stupid. We well, should come to that later. It's, it's very interesting, yeah, question. So the main subject of this talk is the first question, uh, what is the chemical, physical, mathematical mechanism for this? But one can pose also question why hexagonal lattice and why are such patterns beneficial and how they develop evolutionary. So uh, why such patterns beneficial, I already answered, they're beneficial for camouflage. Uh, and uh, uh, they also have these blue things on the sides, which, uh, which are different. Those are probably for attracting sexual partners, but that's sort of less, less clear. And uh, why hexagonal lattice? Why is there is hexagonal lattice of skins? Well, that's... Uh, actually has the same answer as the covering, only with different chemicals. So it, again, Turing equation kicks in, and uh, in that parameter range it has a solution which is like hexagonal lattice. Well, think abrikosov lattice or something if it's, it's efficient for many systems. And then uh, sort of uh, its skin collapses on the boundaries of hexagons, and then you get this sort of very, very convex scale. And how it's developed evolutionary, so how using, as Joy last knows, uh, Glauber, well, the mechanism is very, very simple. And if you tilt a little bit the parameters, you can, div can get different coverings, like all these animals, and then it just evolutionary chooses. You don't even need uh, that many generation, the parameters which are particularly good for this environment. So there are very strong, very close cousins, which are genetically the same, which live in different region uh, in the desert, and they are like completely single cover. So it's, so it's, it's evolutionary pretty fast. So the first question is, what is the chemical, physical, mathematical mechanism for all this? How does the Ising model appear? And uh, the interesting thing is, it's so, it's, it's very, I mean, first thing when, when he showed this, I said, well, look, I, I remember when as a kid, I read in a popular book that Turing ex explained the covering of the animals, but it's still conjectural. He said, well, it's no longer conjectural. Indeed, it, now it has been established. Uh, and uh, that would be the first step in this thing, is how to sort of uh, move uh, in the direction of some mathematical or physical model. So Turing, in one of his last papers, uh, The Chemical Basis of Morocophagenesis, uh, so uh, uh, he uh, suggested that patterns can arise from solving the reaction diffusion equation. So the first part is just the diffusion equation, and it's uh, clear that if you have some pigment in the skin, it will eventually diffuse, maybe, albeit maybe very slowly. But that would be that if you have a cow who has a black spot, eventually the cow will be gray. So nothing interesting. But suppose that you have some reaction between them. And the first one to consider this was Kumagorov on the line, but on the line you don't get interesting patterns. And uh, Turing suggested that if you have non-trivial reaction site, you can get patterns of animals. As far as I understand, at that time this uh, paper wasn't taken seriously, and then, like decades later, there were experiments in chemistry where there were chemical reactions getting some patterns, and people even got Nobel prizes for that. And now it's experimentally established for some animals. And what I find really interesting, so he didn't have access to computers at that moment already. And here is an example of a computer experiment he get he did himself on a piece of a root paper. So he just himself so did 5,000 iteration of, uh, of PD on a, on, on a, on a millimeter paper. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing. And yeah, and then you get to be played by Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, well, now that's, that's the real Turing. Uh, and uh, here are three simulations with different parameters which produce different patterns. Uh, why the two did not start? Ah, oh, no, they did start. And maybe I'll just switch to the next, uh, next slide, which has uh, even more simulations. So this is, this is just me doodling around uh, in some RDE solver. 
And you see, it's, it all has basically the same reaction coefficient, which looks like that. So it's 0, and then it's linear, and then it's 1. And you just change the slope, and you get very, very, very different patterns. So there are some stable ones, and there are three stable ones uh, on a plane, either with dots or with parallel lines, so this libertarian like we have. And there are also oscillating ones and chaotic ones. And it's actually interesting because it's, uh, there is this huge literature about pattern formation. If you, if you look to like these magnetic patterns uh, you study in experimental physics, you also have similar <coughs> patterns. And there is very, very little rigorously known, but probably it all has to do with Fourier modes, etc. There are lots of books about reaction diffusion equation. Again, very few theorems. It's very, very difficult to do. Okay, now uh, why the patterns emerge? So there is this sort of diagram that you have, uh, suppose that you have uh, two different substances, uh, say two different pigments, for example, black and green. And uh, black, uh, for example, uh, well, green, for example, activates black. So the more green you have, the more black you produce. But then the chemistry is such that black then kills green. Then the more black is, the more green is killed, so you kill green and it's all black. <coughs> but when there is no black, uh, when, when there is there's all black, there is little green and then the black arises. So you get this sort of vicious circle where you oscillate between black and green. One is producing another, the other is killing this one and, and, and so on and so on. And you can get really interesting patterns. Now, as I'm saying that biologists have checked this experiment in the last 20 years. So there were, uh, well, several groups, uh, the one in Max Planck in Germany, one in Japan. And they did experiments for the zebra fish of, of this type that they, uh, by hand, they, they sort of understand which, which chemicals are there. And they, by hand, uh, sort of try different uh, regimes of the RDE. And, uh, for example, what they did, they burned with laser some region, and then they did the same, they started with the same, the same numerical data, and then put to zero this region. And then they solved this numerically, and then they uh, let the fish evolve. So it's, it's not very painful for the fish, it's just like uh, getting a tattoo. And uh, you see, it's, it's really surprisingly very close to, to so in a sense, it's, it's, it's kind of a good enough experimental explanation. So that they know, they know, uh, and uh, we can select out of uh, animals studied before, we can select the ones which have sort of similar pigments. And uh, for example, this is uh, the values which you see, it's, it's very easy right hand side, which is, uh, uh, so you have this sort of diffusion thing, you have Laplacian, you have diffusion coefficients, uh, you have this just u or v or w, you multiply it by something, you have nonlinear part, which is essentially linear. It's zero, uh, then it is linear, uh, and then it is uh, again equal to some maximum f max. In our case, this is 0.5. Uh, and uh, uh, what is sort of interesting here is that yeah, and th those uh, uh, this produces very close pattern to what we have. The only problem it completely disregards hexagonal lattice, uh, and uh, the patterns is alike, but it's not sort of uh, doesn't click into the hexagonal lattice. We get a continuous one. But these this are the coefficients which were already in previous papers because people studied lots of different animals and you, you could sort of uh, tweak them so that we get the ones. Now, Sorry. yes. Uh, you really need 18 parameters to reproduce this? Ah, <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> no, you, you, it's, it's very interesting. You, it's actually, of course, uh, you need, uh, you, you, one, one component equation is not enough. You need two component equations. That's, that's, that's certainly. For some reason, in most uh, physical systems I have seen, uh, uh, it's actually three, though you can artificially put it down to two. In our case, unlike the fish, uh, so in the fish, there were, there were irida force, uh, which was sort of this greenish uh, things, which, for example, for the case of hamelons are crystals. There are xanthophores, which are yellow, and melanophores, which are black. So in our case, it's, uh, there are the force, but they don't play important role. Uh, they only these two play important role, <coughs> but there are two mechanisms of interacting between them. And for that reason, the last two here are Milana force, uh, but you see the diffusion coefficient. So these diffusion coefficients, they are more or less the sort of diffusion as you think about it is just uh, some chemical substance propagating from cell to next cells, but also cells signaling to its neighbors something. But uh, the Milan force also do some uh, far-reaching signaling, this sort of delta-notch uh, pathways. Uh, it's, uh, 
well, okay, it's a proteins which sort of shoot through the boundary of a cell. It sometimes go, go as, as far as 10 cells away. And this mechanism is, plays an important role in, in, morpho in our morphology, for example, when we develop and, you know, the cells, they start sort of branching into different specialities when they have to store, uh, well, they, this is done through this mechanism and then when they have to stop, it's sort of slowed down. Uh, so here, this place, it's also plays an important role, but in principle, I think uh, you can condense this equation in two. The only thing it's actually in three, it's actually, well, I mean, U, V, and W are actual uh, concentrations of some chemical substances. So it, for us, it makes sense. Uh, now, uh, whether you need all these parameters, well, look, uh, you, need, uh, you need essentially, well, you have you have three concentrations, so there are three functions and the, the interaction, basically, you should have something, uh, you should introduce some nonlinearity by such a thing. Well, yeah, you, 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 you can uh, artificially, you saw, it's like jumping on a carry-on bag before going to an airplane, you can artificially squeeze it into probably nine, but, but yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I, I, that's, that's more illustrative because uh, I sort of can say why, why, why this has this, this order of the value. Of course, it's not that we experimentally can extract a cell and measure what it should be from the first principles. Yeah, but I guess the question was, suppose that I quiggle with these parameters, are you going to get very, very different? No, 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 no. In, in, a, in a neighborhood, you will get the same. Es essentially, it's kind of sort of universality in pattern formation, which is many books are written about. It's like fractals about which you have many books, but there is no general theory. Generally, it's, it's I've shown you these pictures, though, uh, all of them, they will produce one of these kinds of six patterns. But how can he claim to determine the parameter C2 with... Ah, no, no, it's in some region. So uh, the, the claim is that these parameters fit it. And uh, there is a general region, certainly plus minus 5% doesn't, doesn't hurt. O okay, look, I mean, if uh, lettuce is more exposed to the sun or if lettuce did some push-ups in the morning, it changes the parameters, obviously. And uh, so it's, it's, it's fairly robust in this region, yeah. But, okay, so uh, why every scale is of a single color? Well, the thing is that, that uh, this particular lizard, uh, unlike like all snakes and many other lizards, it doesn't have a flat skin. The uh, scales are rather protruding. And here there are actual cutoffs of two scales. One was of green color, one was black. So here you, s you see all this uh, melanin and here you see this sort of greenish crystals and they hide the melanin. Uh, and uh, the sort of logical conjecture was that just the diffusion between two nearby scales is much, uh, much less than inside the scale. Yeah, of, of course, every scale is, is, uh, is composed of hundreds and hundreds of cells. So the diffusion between cells here is more than diffusion between cells across this boundary. So the conjecture was that uh, what we do, we take the equations which already were studied by people, then superimpose uh, this uh, late hexagonal lattice and introduce two parameters that uh, there is this epsilon width interscale space. Well, I, I included five jokes about scales in our paper, like scale of scales, because there is this double meaning. There are two scales and there are scales of a lizard and technical editor erased all these jokes. <laughs> it was so horrible. I mean, I tried to hide at least one, uh, but uh, so uh, there is these two parameters, epsilon width and how much diffusion small, let's say P and epsilon, actually it's the same parameter you can, uh, you can just what, multiply them, yeah. And uh, then the interesting thing that uh, indeed uh, we fairly quickly found the parameters where, but you can see this on the picture, which generates the, uh, the pictures which really, uh, so you run continuous system in the plane, but uh, Imaginary hexagonal lattice is superimposed and when it intersects, you decrease the diffusion, diffusion coefficients. And then it forces, it forces uh, you can sort of uh, imagine this uh, that if the front of reaction diffusion equation goes through a hexagon, it goes very, very fast. But in this space in between hexagons, it goes very, very slowly. So most of the time it spends in the space between hexagons, so you never see it going through a scale. Actually, we have, I think, two, just two pictures of the lizards where it goes through a scale. So in, it goes through a scale, but it goes very, very, very fast. And there was a perfect, uh, perfect numerical fit. So this is, I think, the, the animation where you do uh, this uh, continuous reusion, uh, reaction diffusion equation, and you get the same pictures as for lizards, so for the, for the easing model. And the interesting thing that if you change this P epsilon parameter, then you see these different pictures where 
uh, when uh, when epsilon is uh, is uh, when the spice with when the this decrease in diffusion coefficient is not small then you see this usual continuous pictures and then it sort of clicks and you get these two cell strips two scale strips and then it clicks to what we actually see uh, and the most interesting thing that you can observe it in a in a particular lizard because the scales on a tail are much bigger and then you actually see these sort of pictures then the diffusion front sometimes goes the reaction diffusion front goes through a middle of a scale so you actually actually see it <coughs> for the lizards so this uh, this sort of explains how you can explain it with Turing's uh, reaction diffusion equation why you would see these boundaries between scales uh, there very very nicely now the question is about uh, what we saw experimentally we saw experimentally that uh, and it sort of explains why all the scales are of a single color because in the scales this if there is a rd front going on so black changes uh, brown changes into green it goes in through very fast but doesn't explain why we get glauber dynamic and then there was a sort of two-step thing so one step thing is that uh, of course, you know what I do for a living. I study discrete complex analysis, so at least <coughs> part time. That I said, well, okay, if it's uh, every scale is of the same color, uh, then we just uh, have to define this u function not in the continuous plane, but only at the centers of the hexagons, and just put instead of Laplacian discrete Laplacian and put this function. And let's let's try to do it. And then it, it was a very interesting thing because uh, they already tried to do it. They are very smart biologists, said, but we cannot, couldn't uh, get the coefficients right. And I say, well, let, let me think, think one evening. And I thought, and I came up with this formula, and uh, I said, well, it's a wild guess. I say, why? Because it has square root of three in it. And then I felt like this, you know, story of Jen Wigner of uh, statisticians <laughs> saying, uh, explaining to a lay person that uh, the population distribution has pi in it. And he says, well, what pi has to do with population distribution? It's the length of a circle. Uh, so here, of course, square root of three. I said, well, of course, it's square root of three over two because it's a it's, uh, cosine of 60 degrees. Uh, and then I had a sort of, you know, uh, they went away. They did computer simulation. Then they come next morning and say, you know, you mathematicians are really, really smart. You just wrote a formula that perfectly works. And I felt like mathematician 5,000 years ago was sort of predicting solar eclipse to, to a pharaoh and uh, trying to, 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 ex to explain to him all these periods, etc. But, but, but they, they, they're actually very, very, very smart, know, know a lot of mathematics and physics. So we, we got very excited. And then it turned out that we actually can prove it. I flash lots of slides. It's kind of, you know, this, if you really want rigorous proof for mathematics, uh, uh, then, then you need this fast and slow variables and you need, uh, but in, indeed in some regions, as, as we've seen in some regions it doesn't work, but in some regions I, I can actually prove it. Mm, but, uh, well, okay, I just, I don't want to scare you. Yeah. <laughs> we have seen too many formulas today. Uh, yeah, but, but I rem remember it's, it's, it really was like repeating this story about pi and, uh, and here are these three, three, three simulations which uh, look almost identical. They don't look identical in the beginning because in the beginning you start uh, not with everything black or green, but you start rather with different parameters and sort of you slowly move in. But after some time, they, even the flippings will look the same and you can distinguish which one is which. So it's, it's uh, Glauber dynamics, discrete, re discrete re reaction diffusion, and continuous reaction diffusion. Can you explain again <laughs> what the proof of what <laughs> was it? Ah, the, because we're proving what? Ah, no, the, well, that's, uh, that's, uh, well the, that's, that step was, well, I don't want to scroll back because it's a lot of slides. Did I put it uh, on the next slide? I think I, I thought that's any, well, no, no, I didn't. I, I, I did that uh, uh, reducing of uh, continuous, uh, continuous Turing uh, equation where on the boundary of hexagons you have smaller diffusion to the discrete one. It, it, is, it doesn't hold in every regime. It holds only in these fast regimes where the front moves through a hexagon very fast. So you can assume that every hexagon is of some fixed color. So basically your continuous function looks like on this hexagon it has this value which corresponds which is somewhere in the region which we perceive with our eyes as as black, this is in some region which we perceive as our eyes as green, and in between it kind of. You can also imagine it that the parameters are such that uh, you run it in the plane, and then the hexagonal lattice is composed of hexagons very many meters apart, so the front moves, but you only see it when it hits the hexagon, otherwise, you probe it at this lattice. But, but I think that that would be 
But, but that, that's, that's, yes, Sartor. Is your coefficient related to a quantum dimension? It looks like a Jones index. Uh, what looks like? The square, square root of three over two over two. Ah, no, it's, it's sine of, uh, sine of uh, 30 degrees, sorry. But, uh, well, maybe those two are related. Yeah, everything is, yeah. And now the, the interesting, uh, the end point, so we are trying to do now is how to deduce from this Glauber dynamic. And I must say there is uh, really very little rigorously known about reaction diffusion and continuous. In the discrete, I haven't found much literature. And we have good numerical understanding, and it's basically some sort of flow, a complicated equation. And uh, at some point, I thought that there is, uh, there is uh, a superficial resemblance to the renormalization group uh, of the Ising model. And you know, of course, this, this picture we all steal from, from Michael Fisher. Uh, but uh, it actually might be a bit more than superficial if you analyze how it appears. So basically, uh, what one can do, uh, let's uh, for a moment freeze all scales except for one. So we freeze all the scales except for this one and see how it evolves. And in a sense, you are allowed to do it because uh, uh, everything, well, the scales, they just change very fast, and uh, so this will change, then another one will change, so you can think that this is delocalized. And then if you, I look at this equation, so the neighbors are present here, so I just store them away as some constant, and what I get is equation that is just ordinary differential equation, derivative of u is constant times u, plus this uh, nonlinear part, uh, but nonlinear part is piecewise linear, and we have, well, it's again a question of reducing the number of variables, so we have three variables, each of them had three regimes, zero, linear, one. So there are 27 regions, and each of these 27 regions, this equation is linear. And if you have a linear equation, it's clearly you have either attracting point uh, or a fixed uh, or a repelling point or a saddle point. Linear, you cannot do anything else. Well, you can also shift by one, but here it's clear. Uh, of course, if you have this 27 region, it may be that for one region, if you calculate the fixed point, it will actually not belong to this region, so it will be relevant. So it turns out that for all things, for all parameters values which are reasonable, you'll get uh, three fixed points. And uh, in most of them, uh, so for example, this is true if you have uh, four green neighbors and two brown neighbors, that uh, the picture is like that, that uh, uh, there is this three-dimensional space, and our piecewise linear system has three uh, fixed points, one is green, one is brown. So what do I mean by brown? It, uh, there is this whole space of pigments, and there is a region of space which our eyes perceive as brown. But it's not like one point, there is a whole region which we, uh, and we tried actually to do a little bit more in infrared regime, you get a little bit better, but, but, but not. But there is this whole uh, space of colors you can get with these two, uh, actually two and a half pigments. Uh, but uh, there are two fixed points which are green and brown in green and brown regions. There are other regions which are more yellow. There is a third one. So the third one, unsurprisingly, since we don't see it, it's repelling. But the interesting thing that uh, if you do this numerical values, that what you see that uh, uh, brown is attracting, green is saddle. So if you would have had really such thing in a physical way, it would mean that uh, uh, after initial hiatus, many things, they go into the brown sink, so they are brown and they are firmly brown. Now, uh, those who go into the green sink, some of them are on this hyperbolic trajectory, so they will speed, spend basically infinite time traveling, but then they just speed up towards brown. So that would mean that if lizard lives to uh, 100 years, it will be all brown, but they don't live to 100 years, unlike using model. So, uh, uh, but then what an interesting thing happens, first you can have uh, like random perturbations, but also you can change the number of hex, uh, the colors of hexagons which are neighboring, and then this constant changes, and then your whole piecewise linear thing is carried a little bit to the side, and then some new fixed points might arise. And it turns out that there is a strategy where there is a place where these two things, they kind of swap, <coughs> so it indeed might, might go on forever. So the ideal scenario, and I think this again a question left slow whether there are exactly these parameters. So I, I think that in this region there are parameters which would give these two points, both as saddle points, and the saddle points with cones which are proportional in aperture to, to the probabilities of Glauber flips. And then it would make sense that you go to one, then if you're not exactly in the cone, you flip back to the other one, and, uh, and you have that. But, uh, but that's, that's, that, that would be mostly interesting, not even because of the lizard, that we understand very well, but rather because of 
it would be nice to understand rigorously what happens with these patterns in reaction diffusion equations. So that's, uh, well, that's his cousin who lives in Armenia and Georgia. And well, those are the three steps. So uh, Senya was asking about this one. And that sort of finishes the first part of the talk. Uh, now, I, I thought that, uh, well, I, I, uh, as I said, I thought that I, I should say something about easing model. Now, I, I, uh, I stopped thinking about easing model when it stopped turned 100. Maybe I should restart again, and as many people suggest about three-dimensional version, but you know, it's, it's like when I, once I asked one of my favorite mathematicians, Jean Bourguin, Jean, have you ever thought about the Riemann zeta function conjecture? And he said, Stas, yes, of course. And he said, and what? Well, I thought it for two weeks, but being smart is not sufficient to do it. And he's one of the smartest people I, I knew. And uh, well, uh, so I don't, uh, well, I don't have anything uh, uh, new about, about the easing model, but I will say just a few words about uh, percolation, which is easing at infinite temperature. And uh, it sort of uh, relates to Slav's comment uh, yesterday that we mathematicians all should go and do renormalization. Of course, we try to go and do renormalization, but it's well, it's slightly easier than Riemann zeta function, but still it's, it's very difficult. And the reason uh, I would still advocate why we do sometimes discrete things, I mean, first uh, and foremost, if we ever to do renormalization, we would have, we would like to have a very precise description of what we're renormalizing to. And that will give us sort of a, well, as Archimedes said, so you just give it as a reference point and then we will we'll construct renormalization. Uh, but also it's, it's beautiful and you get nice algebraic structures. And what I want to say, uh, well, I want to, to say a few words about, um, so there was this old proof of percolation conform invariance and uh, just a year or two before COVID, we streamlined it so that it looks much nicer, but that got an unexpected pra, uh, continuation more recently, which relates, for example, to Evillian talks and this connection probabilities. So we look at the easing on hexagonal lattice at infinite temperature. Well, that is percolation. Uh, so we just randomly cover, uh, cover the hexagons. We look uh, at the white ones as the holes in the yellow rock, and then we put blue liquid on top, it seeps through. So we look at connection probabilities because spin correlations are trivial. Uh, and uh, there was this famous derivation by John Cardi following uh, the paper of uh, Langwitz and his co-authors where he uh, derived uh, physically using uh, CFT and Belayan Pelikov Zamalochikov that uh, a probability of, uh, so he assumed that the probability, there is a limiting probability, there is a scaling limit. He assumed that it's conformal invariant, then it must depend only on conformal models of our configuration. And then he moved one of the points, did use some Riccati type equation and got this, this thing, that probability of a crossing in critical percolation is this hypergeometric function. So uh, this was starting point uh, for us to prove something mathematically, because once you prove this, you can connect it to schramm levin revolutions, and then we can actually prove now more exponents and dimensions than, than there was in physics literature. And uh, well, we have, I think, be better understanding. But uh, there were a couple of things about this proof, which I didn't like at the time, uh, and uh, hence I never sent it for publication. But uh, uh, now we can streamline. So first I, I make some, well, I remind some observation, which is nice uh, and which was made by Leonard Clareson. It doesn't play an important uh, role in actual proof. You can do without it, but it makes the proof much nicer. And so the observation by Carlson is that this hypergeometric function, which also can be written like that, is actually a Christopher Schwartz map to an equilateral triangle. So since there is a conformal invariance, confor the probability of connection between these two half line and interval to intervals on, on the half plane is the same as between this interval in uh, the opposite sign in equilateral triangle. And then here it has much nicer form with just the length of this interval. And uh, this is actually what uh, attracted uh, Carlson and Schramm and many mathematicians to the subject because before we had a scary 2F1 hypergeometric function, now we had just a linear function and it was very cute. Uh, and uh, Leonard thought for a while that it has to do with the hexagonal lattice structure. Now it turns out it has to do with center of charge zero because then in some variables it will, it leads to 60 degrees. Uh, but uh, the question is, so how to do a proof? And uh, well, okay, so the original proof was that we move Z not on the boundary like John, uh, but inside and we look at the three probabilities. So there is a probability there is a blue thing separating A and Z from C and B is the same as was crossing, but the, also you can do HBHC. 
and the proof was that they are approximately harmonic conjugates uh, and you have enough boundary values to deduce them. So now there is a much clearer proof which connects to using model and uh, which doesn't have the word approximately in it. So uh, this is, uh, we write, uh, this is a representation through uh, O of N model. So instead of uh, drawing uh, all the colors, we can just draw the loops which separate them. So we can just go back and forth between these two pictures. And uh, if you want from this picture a picture of loop, you just draw a loop bit separating. You draw all, 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 the, uh, all the fronts between uh, yellow and blue clusters. Uh, and uh, if you want to do it the back, backwards, you start with one hexagon, so you need to fix cover of one hexagon, but then you cover all the neighbors the same, except if they are separated by a loop, then you change the cover. So it's just an easy thing. And this is a particular representation of O of N model. Uh, in general, it's N to the power number of loops, X to the power length of loops. So N to the power one is expansion of Ising model and it gives critical one, one over square root of three. It's, it's the Kramers Vanier or other Vanier paper. And then at infinite temperature Ising that is percolation X one. So in our picture, all the pictures are equally likely. So I take with the equal probability one over two to the power area, all the possible loop configurations. Now, the nice thing is that uh, uh, what does it mean that there is a blue cluster uh, top down? It means that Z is connected to A and B is connected to C. And there is a yellow anti cluster left right if there is another connection. So these two connections, uh, they correspond to just uh, two, two different crossing events. So it's again the same, the same picture. For example, here is a blue cluster. Uh, uh, yeah. So now, uh, what uh, was a uh, nice observation made by, by my student Misha Kristoforov is that the function h of z, uh, which was probability that there is a blue cluster separating z and b from a and z, it's actually just the partition function of uh, this model when you say that there are disorders at c and b and a and z. So we take a loop model. And we draw all loop configurations uh, where uh, there are loop, uh, besides loops, there are two curves, uh, three, two curves starting at A, Z, C, and B. And H of A is a partition function when the one at A ends at Z and one at C ends at B. So if, uh, well, I wanted to reproduce yesterday the picture, but then I realized that it's on the poster of the conference, so this Clemon's pictures for the easing model. So if you try to cover this, you, you would get a picture like Clemon on the poster, or which, which he showed yesterday, no, the day before yesterday. Uh, so it's, it's an easy observation and it actually, actually goes uh, uh, like that, that you uh, can, let me see, I, I think I had this picture, yeah, well, it, it had, so you can condition on these loops and then you ask how many ways are there to cover or to draw loops in this white region. And the number of ways to cover is two to the power area. But the number to draw loops is the same. We don't care whether there is a disorder operator or not here. Because disorder operator you can just realize by taking the usual covering and then having a designated slit and saying that when you pass the slit, you change yellow to blue and blue to yellow. So there is exactly the same number of uh, coverings and, uh, uh, oh, and of loop models. And here is the same. You can just condition on the rightmost blue thing and then study covering so loops. So this is a nice representation of these functions H A, H B, and H C, and also we do them now on on middle of the arcs, and then the uh, second observation. Uh, let me see. It's the next slide. Uh, second observation is that H A plus H B plus H C of Z is equal to one. So it was uh, mentioned in the original paper, but. Uh, uh, and then Van Sanbi Farah had a nice rewriting of my paper where he played around, around this. Uh, and uh, here it's sort of trivial observation uh, because uh, what happens? We write partition function with these three disorders on the boundary, one inside. It's two to the power area. But how many ways are there to connect these four points? Well, there are exactly three ways. And it's HA, HB, and HC. So they sum exactly to one. So that's, 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 that is very easy. Now, uh, what will play a crucial role is discrete cauchy equations. And here on hexagonal lattice, if we have function on edges, we say that they dis satisfy discrete cauchy if the functions on these uh, three vertices or these three edges, 
they just try this equation where tau is the cube root of unity. So you sum them with coefficients 1, cube root of unity, another cube root of unity. Uh, and um, well, it's, it's actually the same as just sum them with coefficient p minus v, q minus v, and r minus v, because the vectors they point as cube roots of unity. But the interesting thing about this equation is that uh, it's like contour integral along this trivial contour, and you can sum this for all the neighbors, and then whatever is inside it cancels out because you have the same, the same edge in two opposite directions. So you get this contour integral that the sum for these edges on the boundary with appropriate coefficients is equal to zero. So it's like a discrete Riemann sum for a usual contour integral of f of z dz. So if we have some sequence of discrete functions which are discrete analytic and if it converges to some continuous function, then it will be analytic because its contour integrals are zero. So it's a basic theorem from complex analysis textbook. So it's an example of a law uh, of a small scale law which propagates to large scale and which determines your function uniquely. Now, uh, uh, well, that I already shown. Uh, and uh, now let's do this function f, which is another symmetric sum of h's, but not with coefficients 1, 1, 1, but with coefficients which are three cubes of roots of unity. So you take these pictures with factor 1, this with factor tau, with this factor tau squared. And uh, you can think of it as barycentric coordinates because you have three vectors which sum to 0 and you put uh, in front of them numbers which sum to 1, positive numbers which sum to 1, and you can get there is a unique way to represent every, every point in the plane. So uh, what we uh, do next is that we observe that this function f is satisfies this cauchy riemann equation. And standard Tarosa Seymour Welsh argument, standard for like at least 42% uh, of the audience, uh, show that there is a subsequential scaling limit, and then it means that, uh, well, the, for the limit, the integral contra integral range, so it's an analytic function, and I will come to boundary values in a minute. Now, how we show this? It's an easy train track argument. So suppose we look at three neighbors of a given vertex V. And uh, there are essentially three different pictures of what can ha happen nearby. One picture is that one of these interfaces arrived here, but there is nothing else. But that it contributes one to one of the functions, and you can prolong it to the right or prolong it to the left, it contributes one and one to the other. Then there is a way that it arrives here, and there is a loop. Again, you can do this change of train tracks, and then again it contributes one to each of them. And the interesting one is that it arrives and there is not a loop, but there is a curve joining two other disorders. And then you can play train tracks as before, but coefficients will be different because here you start from A, so coefficient is 1. Here you start from C, so the coefficient is tau. Here you start from B, so the coefficient is tau squared. And then, surprise, surprise, if you sum these three numbers, which are 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and 1, tau, tau squared, if you sum them with coefficients 1, tau, tau squared, you always get 0. Here because you sum cube roots of unity, here because you sum of cube roots of unity, and here because you sum, well, squares of cube roots of unity, which also happen to be cube roots of unity. So there is this sort of magic. You get this discrete analyticity, and then you get very nice boundary values, because suppose <laughs> that point Z is on boundary. You can have such picture, you can have such picture, but not such picture, because of topological reasons, CB, CZ and AB would have to intersect, so this is not allowed. So we have convex sum not of vectors 1, tau, tau square, which can give you any number in the plane. But you have a convex sum of vectors 1 and tau, which can give you only a number which is on an interval between numbers 1 and tau. And it means that if you take your whole domain ABC, then uh, this arc is mapped to the interval 1 and tau. Another one is mapped to the interval tau and tau square. And the third one is mapped to the interval tau square and 1. So you have an analytic function in the limit inside, which maps three boundary arcs to three sides of triangle. Then by, uh, by argument theorem, it's, it's a map to the triangle. Uh, and if, if you really like hypergeometric functions, you can map it to half plane and get hypergeometric function. And there is no approximate linearity. It's, it's really nice. And uh, we written up, we sent it to journal, it got rejected without any comment. <laughs> But, you know, I once served under Peter Sarnak uh, in, I don't remember which journal, well, he, he kicked me out because I was too slow. And uh, he said, good journal should practice random rejections. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
So you get this cardi carlison form, or if you wish, you can map to triangle. Now, uh, what uh, relates, so this relates to the talk and this connection probabilities, but we tried for a while to see whether we can do more, whether we can do endpoint connection probabilities. So, for example, did you use some exponents uh, from this? Because you get, for example, half plane exponent one third, but can you deduce like nine, uh, uh, like 91 over 48? And not without some success, there is very interesting algebra arising. And I'll just tell about, well, okay, that's, that's how to do a silly from this. Uh, so there is uh, this uh, two point uh, observed version of this observable, I have enough time to tell which we did with Mrs. Kipinkov and Mrs. Kristoforov. So let's allow point B, B, B to move inside. And then, of course, we need to do the same train track argument. And uh, there are now more terms in the train track argument. And at first glance, it doesn't work. You don't get function which is analytic in Z and B. But then it turns out, uh, uh, wait a second. Yeah, then it turns out that uh, uh, there are, if you go, oh, well, sorry. Something went wrong. There are uh, four different ways to connect points. Well, there, there are three ways to connect points, but two of them are topologically different because Z and B are under the curve AC or over. And you can play with coefficients in front of those. So let's sum into our function F these four pictures with different coefficients. It turns out there is essentially a unique choice of coefficients so that you get function which is homomorphic in Z and anti homomorphic in B. Uh, and actually, it's up to linear transformation. So, for example, I can rotate this rhombus and I can get such coefficients which would be more beautiful, but these ones are better because they are real and imaginary. And it's the difference here between Z and B, they are symmetric. So, how? They are anti symmetric. They are anti symmetric. You see, it's homomorphic in Z, anti homomorphic in B. Well, the picture, they are symmetric. No, they are not because here it's 3i and here is minus 3i when you. Uh, Wait a second, uh, Z and B. Uh, no, it should be, no, they are not symmetric here. Because here A connected to B is plus one, A connected to Z is minus one, they are anti-symmetric. Okay, so with this, with this choice of coefficients, they yes, are, yes, you can yeah, do a different yeah, choice, yeah, then it will yeah. be. And uh, then uh, what you can do, you can do the boundary value. So if we put B on the boundary, this picture is impossible, but the other three pictures are possible. And essentially the coefficients are such that you get exactly our previous function. So the boundary values, now boundary values, it's, it used to be one domain, but now we have two points in the domain. So the space is domain squared. So boundary values is just one domain. And it would be enough to, to have, for example, argument, but we know the precise values. And the precise values are given by the previous function. And then we deduce the value in half plane. So it's in half plane, it's just the previous function is phi, phi from, uh, from the Carlson map to triangle. So it's phi of z over b bar minus 1. So this, that's the formula. So, uh, uh, well, that's this phi of Carlson, which is maps to triangle. So that's, that's the formula. Now, uh, this phi, which is mapped to triangle, so again, maybe let me flash this, this is the answer. So this is clearly analytic in Z and anti-analytic in B. It satisfies appropriate boundary values. It's easy to check, but then it's inside is the same. Now, uh, what we can do, I want a nicer form of that. So what I do, I do use Schwartz reflection and I extend across this side triangle. And here the pre-image of this side was this half line. So I extend half plane. So it's what I have on the left is half plane with this slit from zero to infinity. And on the right, I have a uh, rhombus and we all love not only hexagons, but also rhombi. And uh, this diagonal is mapped to this half line. And this is given by this hypergeometric function. Oh. And then uh, what uh, turns out is that, uh, well, this is the, the answer to our question. But let me do one more thing. Let me try to fuse points Z and B. So of course, if in Z, you have this sort of complex dz thing and in B dz bar, then you should get some real observable when you fuse them. And it turns out that essentially when you look at it, uh, that uh, uh, you sort of compare, can compare probabilities. So this uh, and what you recover, you recover probability to be above or below the silly curve. Uh, and uh, the answer you get, plugging in everything before, is this huge hypergeometric function, but you can write it with the rhombus because uh, uh, what you get as an answer with the rhombus, uh, you will get, uh, so on the rhombus you get just 
linear function, you, you just get uh, this. No, ah, now I change the color, this yellow diagonal, which is mapped here by symmetry to the circle. Why by symmetry? Because it's Schwartz reflection symmetric with respect to it, and the whole plane also Schwartz symmetric with respect to yellow circle by inversion. And uh, uh, well, I think that's 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 it. So the probability uh, of uh, uh, if I if I take half plane and I take a silly six here or a percolation perimeter, probability that a given point is to the right of it. Uh, here it was given by that formula mapping to to this guy. I can take square root, then it will be given by a formula of this mapping to to the plane, and that's that's a nice nice neat formula. And the thing which I should have put question on on this thing, the thing which I really don't understand. Uh, well, no, maybe I understand, but not satisfactory. Why you have such nice things as uh, like this elliptic functions, modular forms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all appearing <laughs> in this theory? So we we again did something which which well, it's not a map to triangle. Triangle is nice because triangle you can Schwarz effect to cover the whole plane. Here we get a rhombus, and apparently if we do the the two endpoint connection thing, so it's I, I'm not participating, but uh, uh, Vita Klepsin and. Uh, Mr. Kristoforov are doing that, you also get very, very nice algebra behind. And happy 100 plus minus 2 birthday. Uh, so this is easing teaching the cuts table to young children in Potsdam. He got it a little bit wrong, the cuts table. Maths, yeah, yeah I, say, I say that he, he got it a little bit wrong, the cuts table. Yeah, that's... You know, I mean, I finished early, I still can do one more talk. Thank you, that's <laughs> asked the first question. What's your first question, Stas? Ah, my first question. Oh, well, my first question, I, uh, but you know, you know, it's, I have not a question, but a remark. I, I, it's, I want to question, it's, it's kind of, why do we all love easing model? And uh, it's an interesting question because, well, you know, I mean, people make jokes about easing uh, not proving something there, but I think that he really, in his thesis, formulated rigorously, Lenz did not. And then he actually proved what uh, then became like transfer matrix theory in a trivial <laughs> case though. But also it's interesting that his thesis was quite popular. People read it and uh, it's, it's sort of a paragraph from uh, Pauli's lectures in Solvay in uh, 1930. And he, well, he, he actually was the first to write Hamiltonian as we write it today. Uh, and he says that uh, using Narian Trouvé. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and then he goes on, he suggests another model for magnetism and uh, Heisenberg suggested his, his model for, for magnetism. But uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, if you find something really simple, even if you are guided by wrong observations, because it was done before quantum mechanics when people, well, didn't, didn't well, misunderstood <laughs> electrons and all that. If it's beautiful, I think eventually it will find use not only in mathematics, obviously it will find use in mathematics, but also in physics. If the model is beautiful and it captures many, many phenomena, though I think, I, yeah, I might have a question. So my, my friends who are experimentalists tell that there is not a single alloy where, where fermentism is governed by using model. It's always something more complicated. But there are ferroelectric things, two or three, where it's governed by the using model. But like, on inspirational, well, on a philosophical side, it's really very good. It governs many things, lizards included. <laughs> but uh, well, the question to audience is, do you know any alloys which are really exhibit ferromagnetic easing model? Oh, there are no experimental physicists here. Is yeah. that a question you or <laughs> yeah. No, no, I think there was this experimentalist Birkenau or something at MIT who claimed to have a, a substance that uh, is described by easing. Huh? Yeah. I should talk to him. Yeah. Yeah, there are many substances. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what theoreticians say. That's it's very interesting. But if you talk to real, like real... No theoreticians. No theoreticians. There are, there are anti-ferromagnets and uh, the real things. No, but anti-ferromagnetic. So, so you... Uh, well, okay, I said, is there a single ferromagnetic substance where it's exactly described by the easing model? Ferroelectric, yes. Why, why ferromagnetic? If you, have a, if you have a cubic lattice, ferromagnet is equivalent to anti-ferromagnet. You just change the spins. Well, okay, it's... it's, it's uh, but it doesn't answer my question, yeah. That is your question. I mean, critical... <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm going to be No, it doesn't. <laughs> so I have two questions. 
Di one di is different ones. <laughs> First one, is this paper by you, Scott and Kofa Christoforov, also rejected or is it published? Oh, it's not rejected. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just uh, sort of... Uh, no, oh, it's sort of in final form. I just proof proofreading one more time uh, in my back. But I, I'm doing this already for five weeks. It's it's just uh, you know ten pages. It takes. I, I just carry it around. I think it will proof proofread itself by. <laughs> and, and, and what's the implication of this function of two variables to be holomorphic, anti-holomorphic? Then what you can say knowing this some some arm exponent? Uh, well, we cannot do this. That 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 was my my goal. It, it's 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 uh, again like uh, answering to Slava's criticism. It's. Of course, we all want to do renormalization theory, but exact values you don't get with renormalization theory. You need to start with something, and well, that that that, that was the, the original goal. We're not we're not not there yet, not quite. But also, it's it was sort of interesting because here the proof is very much like the proof for the spin easing, and there are some more similarities. Whereas I was felt uncomfortable about the original one that there was this approximate discrete homomorphism which people did not enjoy. But not all critical exponents are exact. Feigenbaum constant is not exact, but it has been mathematically proven to exist as a fixed point of an argument. No, 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 no. I, mm. So why for the easing model you are... No, no, no. I, I, did, I did not say that. I see determination. Of, of course, proof... Uh, of course, it can very well be that even 3D easing model is exactly solvable, but has no rational exponents that you get that the... whatever, the... The dimension of 3D easing cluster is the fourth zero of uh, Poincare of, of the Riemann zeta function. It's just as good a precise answer, but uh, not a rational number. Uh, but uh, no, I'm just saying that if you if you want uh, e exact numbers, uh, well, I don't know. It's a good question whether Feigenbaum is exact number or not. But in 2D, of course, we we know that most of the numbers, not all, but most, are exact. Feigenbaum, of course, I adore. Yeah. Rick was asking something, no? They were just looking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I think we'll call it a break there, but I do, I do remember that, um, I, I, I'm in doubt, Stas, as to whether your paper's been rejected or not, but I do remember Stas that said once to me that whenever he has a paper rejected, he sends it to a better journal. <laughs> a process which presumably he iterates. And that's the problem. <laughs> but, uh, you know, sometimes you can send a paper to a better journal, but... Uh, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's one, my, my co-author, Felix Pshititsky, told me that he has this method, and I asked him, so, okay, wha but what, uh, wha uh, what happens eventually? Does it come? He said, it always converges, and said, uh, what was the longest one? Well, the longest one was five iterations, and where it was published, in annals. <laughs> of course, it's also the case, presumably, that he's going to iterate his proof of the cardi carlson formula, which last time I heard it was 45 minutes, but he got it down to 20 this time. Congratulations, Carson, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.